a report finding that 26 of the 119 prisoners were innocent. This was his response. I'm more concerned with bad guys who got out and were released than I am with a few uh, that, uh, in fact, were innocent. Twenty-five percent of the detainees, though, twenty-five percent turned out not to have, it turned out to be innocent. They were so where, where are you going to draw the line, Chuck? How well, are you going to know? You. I, is I'm, that I'm too saying high? Is that, you're okay with that margin for I her? have no problem as long as we achieve our objective. But the Republican Party of today has made a choice, and they haven't chosen the Constitution. And so I do think it's, uh, it, it presents a threat if the Republicans are in the majority in January 2025. Let's, let's look at what Cheney said. This is pure Cheney. This is Cheney and Rumsfeld's tactic. They immediately deflect the question, which is a solid question, which they simply can't answer. They immediately deflect it to the other side of the equation. Whether As an election denier has become Speaker of the House, and prominent Republicans have come to embrace election conspiracies as the route to political glory. Whether it's the ticking time bomb argument, which is a fallacious and stupid argument if you really parse it well, or whether it's, uh, as Cheney did here, that, you know, 75 percent were guilty and any one of those might have done something, and so I was good in what I did. This is Cheney, amoral, amoral Cheney. What you must look at, too, and what I wish that interrogator of Cheney had uh, looked at, is we know, we know positively that a minimum, and I suspect it's higher, of 39 people died in the interrogation process. Why does no one ever mention that? Former House Speaker Dennis Hastert pleaded guilty Wednesday to a federal criminal charge connected to alleged hush money payments. By doing this, he is facing possible prison time, but avoiding a trial where more details of the case would become public. Here to discuss is Wall Street Journal reporter Mark Peters from our Chicago Bureau. Thanks for joining us. Mark, what do we know about the details of this well, case so far? Well, I know far? what conservative means, and I think that the most conservative of all conservative values is fidelity to the Constitution. So, you know, there certainly are people today who are caught in this cult of personality, but that's, that's the opposite of conservative. We know, too, that in some of those cases, the military or civilian coroner involved found the cause of that death to be homicide. The most famous case, of course, Alex Gibney in his documentary, Taxi to the Dark Side, Dilawar in Afghanistan uh, is known about, but even that's been forgotten. Said basically he was, uh, he did it so people wouldn't know what he was spending the money on. Uh, and then that was it. That was it. All right. Now, Mr. Hastert was the longest running GOP House Speaker when he retired from Congress in 2007. Is it safe to say this case was a surprise in Washington? Oath and honor. Let me ask you about that oath. If a person is a member of Congress and they've sworn an oath to defend the Constitution, can they defend the Constitution and also endorse Donald Trump? No. So it's they're, inconsistent. They're breaking with their oath by saying they would like him to be the next president. In my view, you know, fundamentally, there is a choice to be made. You can't both be for Donald Trump and for the Constitution. You have to choose. It's a lot of people who are choosing Donald Trump. Yeah. In our nation's 246-year history, there has never been an individual who is a greater threat to our republic than Donald Trump. He tried to steal the last election using lies and violence to keep himself in power after the voters had rejected him. He is a coward. A real man wouldn't lie to his supporters. He lost his election, and he lost big. I know it, he knows it, and deep down, I think most Republicans know it. ...were Democrats. The only Republican, of course, is John McCain. Speaker Wright, the Democratic Speaker of the House, a very powerful speaker, extorted our agency to try to get special favors for the second worst fraud in America in savings and loans. That was Vernon Savings, known to us regulators as Vermin. When we were finally able, able after this political opposition to close Vernon Savings, 96% of its loans were in default. I guess that explains why the celebration of Ronald Reagan's economic policies is essentially a bipartisan affair. Well, sadly it is. This became the Reuben wing of the Democratic Party, which helped set the stage for the current crisis and is preventing in the Obama administration effective responses or sending any of the crooks 
to prison. So I Let followed me the money. My predecessor, Florida Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, had not been the most active chair in fundraising at a time when President Barack Obama's neglect had left the party in significant debt. As Hillary's campaign gained momentum, she resolved the party's debt and put it on a starvation diet. It had become dependent on her campaign for survival, for which she expected to wield control of its operations. Debbie was not a good manager. She hadn't been very interested in controlling the party she let Clinton's headquarters in Brooklyn do as it desired so she didn't have to inform the party officers how bad the situation was. How much control Brooklyn had and for how long was still something I had been trying to uncover for the last few weeks. By September 7th, the day I called Bernie, I had found my proof and it broke my heart. The Saturday morning after the convention in July, I called Gary Gensler, the chief financial officer of Hillary's campaign. He wasted no words. He told me the Democratic Party was broke and $2 million in debt. What? I screamed. I am an officer of the party and they've been telling us everything is fine and they were raising money with no problems. That wasn't true he said. Officials from Hillary's campaign had taken a look at the DNC's books. Obama left the party $24 million in debt $15 million in bank debt and more than $8 million owed to vendors after the 2012 campaign and had been paying that off very slowly. Obama's campaign was not scheduled to pay it off until 2016. Hillary for America The campaign and the Hillary Victory Fund its joint fundraising vehicle with the DNC had taken care of 80% of the remaining debt in 2016, about $10 million, and had placed the party on an allowance. If I didn't know about this, I assumed that none of the other officers knew about it either. That was just Debbie's way. In my experience she didn't come to the officers of the DNC for advice and counsel. She seemed to make decisions on her own and let us know at the last minute what she had decided, as she had done when she told us about the hacking only minutes before the Washington Post broke the news.